Welcome to Five Books for Catholics, where an expert selects and explains five outstanding books on some aspect of Catholic life, doctrine or culture. This episode is part two of an interview in which Dr. David Grummet explains his pick of the five best books for those interested in reading Henri de Lebac. In this second part of the interview, he discusses some further recommended readings. Henri de Lebac, 1896-1991, was a major influence on the Second Vatican Council and on theologians such as Hans Urs von Balthasar and Josef Ratzinger, with whom he founded the journal Comunio. In 1942, he and some fellow Jesuits founded Source Chrétienne, a series that publishes the original text of patristic and medieval Christian writings alongside a French translation. He thereby stimulated within Catholic theology a return to its sources. Putting this ressourcement into practice in his own works, he argued that the Church should retrieve the patristic understanding of the Eucharist, the Church, creation, grace and scripture. In 1983, Pope John Paul II created him a cardinal. David Grummet is Senior Lecturer in Theology and Ethics in the University of Edinburgh. He has recently published Henri de Lebac and the Shaping of Modern Theology, a reader with Ignatius Press. You also mentioned um, several, several, a couple of other books for an extended list. But before getting on to them, I just had a couple of questions. First of all, earlier you mentioned uh, De Lubac as a major representative of Ressourcement. In fact, many would see him as sort of spearhead of the Ressourcement movement. This was a movement within Catholic theology that sought to move beyond neo-scholasticism and draw on the Church's whole theological tradition, particularly the Fathers. Has this project had its day, or is it still pertinent? Mm, that's an interesting one. Uh, my, my answer would, would be would be very much, it is still pertinent. Uh, um, for, for, for De Lubac, I think the sort of retrieving of the treasures from the church's past history and and their interpretation is is an ongoing activity and because our contexts are evolving we need to be open to receiving these historic figures and their reflection anew in each uh, generation I, I guess though at the same time there has been an important shift and development in the way that ancient Christian texts are approached. Uh, and I would see in some small way some of my other work uh, uh, as being a contribution to this. Uh, so there's a lot more interest now than there was in De Lubac's day on the sort of material context of early Christianity and it's outworking in a whole range of sort of practical situations where this is is that sort of the food people ate the way they dressed sort of family relationships gender all, all kinds of other things too so i guess we're less likely to accept now that less likely than in de, de, de lubac's day that resourcement can kind of deliver a, a single coherent body of, of teaching that we can easily interpret and unify. I think now we're, we're more likely to recognise the diversity of voices in that, as women's voices, as, as well as, as men's voices, and how, how the wide range of contexts of, of Christian history uh, issue in different sort of emphases, different inflections uh, in theology. So, yes, in short, the, the task remains hugely important. Perhaps the way quite a few academics are going about it now is, is slightly different. And missing from your list were what are arguably de Lubac's most renowned contributions to 20th century theology. I'm thinking in particular of Su Naturel, Corpus Mysticum. Mm. Um, and these works, along with medieval exegesis, 
curiously focus on debates within medieval theology, whereas de Lubac is often associated with patristic theology. Uh, mm. Did you leave these out, books out because they are too technical for the general reader? Uh, yes, I, I, left, I left them out because they are demanding. Uh, Sunaterel has not been translated into English, although uh, the first part of it is, is available as, as Augustinianism and modern theology, and, and the, the text is very similar. Uh, but, but yes, just, just saying a bit about those briefly, a, a, quite a lot of interpreters of de Lubac and critics of him have tried to measure him against the standards of Thomas Aquinas, because he, for good reasons, has a distinctive place in in Catholic theology and teaching. But it's important to remember that in de Lubac's context, Augustine was, was massively important uh, and, and had been in, in France for sort of several centuries. And particularly a sort of rigorous, rigorous interpretation of all Augustine associated especially with uh, Cornelius Jansenius. Uh, and this sort of gave a sort of reading of Augustine that that perhaps overstated the absolute power that sin had wrought over humans. So humans could do nothing from their own power. Most people were even excluded from the church, according to Jansenius. Only a small elect of people were, was saved. So, so de Lubac was was sort of in in Sunaterel battling against this this current of theology that that had really become dominant in the French Church uh, that gave a very sort of negative, pessimistic reading of of sort of anthropology. And probably was contributing to the to the decline of of the church, uh, sort of people being refused absolution at, at con confession multiple times, uh, people being taught to view themselves as unworthy to receive the Eucharist. Uh, so so this had sort of big practical outworkings in 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 pastoral practice. So is in Sunaterel de Lubac wanted to call into question these readings of Augustine that had developed in the earlier modern period, really, uh, sort of 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, and say, no, there's a different Augustine, who, uh, sort of the Augustine of the, of the, of the Confessions, who, who is really a much more sort of pastorally sensitive, accommodating, human figure in, in quite a straightforward way. Uh, and, and as part of this, uh, de Lubac was wanting to interpret the Sunaterel as, as of being the doctrine, not that God is just kind of isolated up in some distant heaven and, and we can have no contact with God, but rather there is a close relationship between the supernatural and the natural. The natural is not ultimately able to, to, to continue without being preserved by the supernatural. So de Lubac was very much wanting to push against the understanding of, of, sort of a lot of neo-Thomists that uh, there was this realm of pure nature, as they called it, uh, and this was under the influence of Aristotle, the idea that there's a whole area of life where we can just kind of get on with things without any divine assistance. Uh, this is the way de Lubac critically interpreted the doctrine of pure nature. Uh, no, rather for him, the whole of nature is sort of permeated by the supernatural uh, because because ultimately it's it's a it's a creation of God and and so everything we do our kind of daily 
ordinary acts are, are some way sort of dependent on that grace and, and connected with, with that grace. So, yes, the Sur Naturel and Corpus Mysticum, again, a very historical work. Uh, I suppose I touched a bit on the key teaching in it, uh, the, the belief that, that Lubach strongly holds that the Eucharist makes the church, so the church comes out of worship, and this discussion about the about Christ's different bodies. So Christ's sort of historical body, uh, so that is the body Christ had during his during his time on earth, then the bo body of Christ on on the altar present in, in the host and Christ's body eternally in heaven and Christ's whole body, the church. Now, the key argument de Lubach's wanting to make in Sunaturel is that the, the Eucharistic body, so Christ present in the host on the altar, he wants to argue that anciently that was associated with the church. And that it's only in more recent times with, with later medieval theology that it came to be disconnected from the church and mainly connected with Christ's historical body. Uh, so when when we when we receive the, the Eucharist or see the host exposed during benediction, what what are we what are we connecting that with primarily? That's perhaps a good way of getting into what de Lubac is presenting. Are we thinking the host is sort of primarily a sort of manifestation of Christ's body when Christ was 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 on earth? Or, or do we think what well, it's primarily a manifestation of of Christ present in the church? Now, de, de Lubac's not wanting to say ultimately that the two are opposed, but he, I think he's, his message really is there's a danger they can become opposed if if the Eucharist ceases to be the centre of the of the church's life, rather becomes something that's kind of safeguarded and locked away, and and people can't easily get. and And I guess the the, the, the pandemic has been has been an interesting instance of, of this to some extent, because under obligation from sort of secular authorities, many churches and clergy have had great difficulties continuing to make the Eucharist available to people, to, 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 their, to, the, to their, their church members. So during the pandemic, if we think about this in de Lubac's terms and Corpus Mysticum, there probably was a bit of a sort of re-clericalization, re-medievalization, if that's a word, of the of, of, of the Eucharist because of these obligations that, that the church was under. Uh, we're now coming out of that again, uh, thank God, and we now have a more sort of balanced relationship between the sort of church and the the sacrament and and easier access to it in ways that are really important because because it is the Eucharist that makes the church. And the first um, book that you mentioned in your extended list is the discovery of God. Hmm. It opens with the following question: Was Moses right or Xenophon? Did God make man in His image, or is it not rather man who has made God in His? Is this book a follow-up to one of de Lubac's celebrated, uh, to de Lubac's celebrated critical survey of 19th century philosophical atheism, the drama of atheistic humanism? Mm. Yet, yet I, I'm, I'm delighted you made that connection because I'm actually writing a chapter about this at the moment for, for, for a collection. Uh, so, yes, the discovery of God, de Lubac says, emerged out of conversations he had with individuals, uh, including so in the aftermath of the Second World War, who had doubts about their faith. So 
So this, despite of, of all I, all of what I've said about sort of Lubeck having this collective focus in the church for belief, this this sort of has has a more individual starting point. So de Lubac's wanting to argue fundamentally that some kind of sense of the transcendent, some kind of sense that there is something more than what we see and hear and smell in the world around us, is hardwired into humanity. Now, this is something that sort of staunch atheists would, would not accept. They would argue with him on this for, for a very long time. But if one accepts this idea that there's some sort of urge for the transcendent present in, in humanity that, that Christianity expresses, this, this, this is basically de Lubac's trajectory in the book. So he thinks that if we if we sort of engage in introspection, internal reflection, there's something there that is sort of speaking to us, calling to us, that is not simply of us. And he thinks this is how the the, the so-called proofs for God's existence are, are impelled. They're not so much ra rational deductive proofs, but they are they are outworkings of the way that we look at the world and say there must be something beyond what we can currently see. So if we think, for instance, of of the argument for God's existence from from sort of cause that we see around us in the world, so one thing causing another thing, then we say, well, there can't be an infinite regress of causes, so there must be some uncaused cause. Who is God? That's the sort of theoretical expression of, of the kind of thing to do back is wanting to do. He's wanting to say that when I look inside me, when I look in the world around me, there is something more than what I can so straightforwardly see. So, so yes, there is no kind of, sort of closed off materiality that interprets itself, that has full meaning, that satisfies us. We're always yearning for, for something more. And he thinks this even applies to avowed atheists. Uh, so coming back what to what, what was said at the start, uh, he he thinks that that most atheists, despite themselves, are engaged in what what essentially remains uh, a system of religious belief, because they are if if someone is focused on sort of denying God's existence, they're still sort of stuck within theological terms. Uh, but even if we if we take someone like Marx. Karl Marx, uh, as the intellectual impetus to to communism. Uh, well, Marx was sort of reliant on a linear view of history, which is a fundamentally Christian view, on a view of a kind of sort of collective salvation, it in by human effort rather than than by the grace of God. I mean, he also had a sort of remarkably optimistic view of of history, uh, which kind of parroted Christian eschatology. So de Lubac thinks that people who who claim to be atheists so often actually are sort of continuing to depend on Christian ideas at a deep level. And finally, just as the dogmatic constitution of the church is in some regards a central document of the Second Vatican Council, mm. so too is the mystery of the church a central and recurring theme in de Lubac's writings, most notably in The Splendor of the Church and Corpus Mysticum. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. You, however, have chosen the motherhood of the church. What makes this work representative of his ecclesiology? Well, I chose this because it gives a slightly different perspective. You mentioned the splendour of the church. Uh, that was the English translated title, which Delubac didn't like because he thought it presented an image of the church as if it was sort of perfect and almost a sort of heavenly entity, whereas Delubac recognizes the humanness of the church too he he uses the the wonderful imagery of, at one point of sort of the church being being like a sort of quite quite a sort of vulnerable boat being sort of steered along with people on it quite a lot of them not knowing quite what they're doing uh, so he doesn't really like these these over glorified images of the church, unless they're balanced out with these more human images. Uh, yes, so the, the motherhood of the church. Uh, this is interesting because. The, the, the way that gendered images have been used to Im to present the church. Historically have often been in used rather passively, so so. To put it very crudely, in order to make the point, the church has been represented as feminine, as passive, uh, in contrast with as an active male principle embodied in God uh, and in Jesus. However, th this this motherhood of the church uh, uh, approach gives a more sort of active view of well let's say sort of womanhood rather than femininity because even the term feminine to meant to many years would 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 be see heard as suggesting a notion of sort of female gender that's rather sort of passive and neutral but motherhood to Lubach says is sort of active it's passionate it's responsible I mean, sort of pain is part of it. Giving birth is is very often painful for women. So the image of motherhood he he uses, I think, to sort of complicate and correct some of the understandings of how the sort of church's identification with women plays out. I mean, De, I mean, De Lubac is is arguably guilty of this himself in other places. He he has a wonderful memo, uh, meditation on a poem by Teilhard de Chardin on the church as the eternal feminine. But 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 there he does seem to be drawing on this old tradition of the church as feminine and therefore as as sort of passive. But yeah, the the image of motherhood gives gives, I think, a sort of more appropriate understanding for the present day and actually a more exciting understanding of how people who want to understand the church as as in some sense sort of female can 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 do that in a way that's more inclusive and, and sort of theologically richer. Well, Professor David Grummet, thank you very much for your time and taking us in this tour through the work of Henri de Lubac. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. To read or listen to the rest of this interview and gain full access to our archive, visit fivebooksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and give it a top rating on the platform of your choice. That way more people can discover it. You can also support the podcast and help us produce more interviews like this one by making a one-off donation via the link given in the show notes. As little as one dollar, one pound or one euro can help and will be greatly appreciated. Thank you once again and God bless. <laughs>